Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you one of the greatest men of our time. We both came to Washington after the 1980 election under the same mandate from the people, and through his leadership, that mandate is being filled. Fellow Republicans, it is my honor to present the individual who has resolved the American crisis of leadership the man who has met every test and exemplifies the genius of leadership, the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take that under consideration until Sunday night. Well, I thank you, Mac and Bill Harris, Bob Bell, the members of the Congress, Newt Gingrich, and ladies and gentlemen. I have to tell you a little something here that's just reminded me of a story. Two things have reminded me. First of all, uh, I understand that many of you heard me last night. And, uh, I, and, uh, then I happened to hear that, that a great many of you heard me on television uh, just a little while ago. And uh, the other thing is that the, when uh, two gentlemen came in here, that left me backstage with their wives. <laughs> and um, that also helped remind me of the, the story. But the fact that you heard me twice also, it, it happens to be a story of, a, of an older preacher who was talking to a young preacher who hadn't had as much experience. And he said to him, you know, sometimes on Sunday morning they begin to nod off. And he says, I found a way to wake them up. He says, right in my sermon, when I see them beginning to doze, I say, last night, I held in my arms a woman who was the wife of another man. And he said, that wakes them up. <laughs> and he says, then, when they look at me startled, I say, it was my dear mother. <laughs> and, uh, well, the young preacher took that to heart, and a few weeks later, sure enough, there, some of them were dozing off. So he remembered what had been told him, and he said, Last night I held in my arms a woman who was the wife of another man. And they all looked at him and all, everyone was awake. And he says, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> but, but it's wonderful to be here with all of you in Georgia. It wasn't that, wasn't that long ago, uh, yes, when the South was a stronghold for the Democratic Party, but from the spirit I sense here, those days are long gone. <laughs> Today it's the Republican Party that reflects the progress and the vibrance of the New South. And I think, having been a Democrat myself, as I'm sure many of you were also and made the change, and you know what it is like uh, to make that change. But I think that many of us look back, I know I do, and say, did I really change? Or was it that the party of my father and the party that I had belonged to, it changed? It no longer stood for the things that it had stood for for so many years. Amen. I once, as a new Republican, tried to talk the Republican Party into using the 1932 Democratic platform. It called for a 25% reduction in government spending, a return to the states and local communities, autonomy that had been confiscated by the federal government, a reduction and elimination of useless boards and bureaus and uh, departments in government. And I thought, that's still a brand new platform. At least they've never used it. 
but hundreds of Republicans have been elected through the South. Your own Senator Mac Mattingly, Congressman Newt Gingrich, Bill Young, Macon's Mayor George Israel, and others who couldn't be with us, they represent the kind of courageous leadership of which Southerners and all Republicans are rightfully proud. And I'm especially grateful because I've relied heavily on them for the last three years. And all I ask is, send me more. <laughs> you here today are proof of a new solid South about to emerge on the American political screen scene. And only this time, it'll be a Republican South. I predict that in this coming election, we're not only going to hold our own, we're going to make gains throughout the region. The New South will not, for political expediency, be tying itself to political bosses and big spenders in other parts of the country. Those days are over. The New, the new South is concerned about economic growth and expanding opportunity for everyone. The New South is concerned about a strong America and about maintaining the values and the strength of character that made this country the richest and the greatest in history. And now is the time to reach out to our Democratic friends as never before and to tell them how good the water is over on this side. <laughs> Voting Republican isn't half bad. As, as I told you, I know how hard it is to make that first move, but uh, uh, it wasn't me or it wasn't you who have made the same change that moved, as I say, the party moved. Now, once Democratic candidates encourage people to work for the country, I remember, as a matter of fact, a, a young president at his inaugural who said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, and within a matter of weeks, they had introduced 29 new spending programs of what the country could do for the people. <laughs> Today, we see candidates who are trying to buy support by telling people what the country will do for them and making promises to interest groups. Just a while ago, there was a debate up in New Hampshire. Uh, you, uh, there were so many candidates on the platform, there weren't enough promises to go around. <laughs> But I just don't believe the people can be bought with promises anymore that have to be paid for out of the Treasury. They know who eventually ends up paying for all of those promises. I feel sorry for some of those Democratic congressmen, though, at the same time. Can you imagine what it must be like, worn out after a day at the office, they go home, they try to go to sleep, and the first thing you know, they're having nightmares that the money they're spending is their own? <laughs> Calvin Coolidge once said that patriotism is easy to understand in America. It means looking out for yourself by looking out for the country. Well, the Republican message to voters this year is just that. When we vote, we should do it for America. When we choose an election day, we should think of the future of our children. It will require hard work on our part. We have to get our message out, and that isn't so easy in America. There just does seem to be more attention paid to uh, things other than what we have to say. Uh, for example, right now, that whole thing about that all of our problem could be solved if we would just take that defense budget and whittle it down to size. We're so extravagant with defense spending. Well, would you like to know that 1962, the defense budget under the Democratic administration was 48%? Would you like to know also that our budget last year, uh, that was 48% of the whole budget for defense. Our budget last year was 27.6%, uh, 27.6%. And this year, the budget we're asking for will be 28% of the total budget. So no, it isn't that. But again, the distortions keep on uh, coming out. I, the other day, I just heard one of them on television, and he referred to the, to the uh, 
recent recession is my recession. Uh, well, now, as I recall, with those double-digit interest rates and inflation rates and everything and unemployment uh, up there pretty high and climbing, and had been climbing since 1979, uh, we proposed our economic recovery program. But when we fell off into the big dip called the recession, which was really a continuation of the recession that had started in 1979, but when we fell off into that big dip of unemployment and the housing industry folded because of the high interest rates and the automobile companies and the steel companies all shut down and it spread, nothing of our economic recovery program had been put in place yet. It wasn't there. We were still operating on the last budget of theirs, which we had to inherit. We came into office. Georgia, apologize. Yeah. Well, but seriously, these are, <laughs> these are economic matters that, that a great many people don't understand. For example, right now, the whole talk about the deficits. No one wants more than we do. For years, we've been complaining about them. But we started deficit spending 50 years ago. And for 46 of those 50 years, the Democrats had a majority in both houses of the Congress, to say nothing of how many times they also had the White House. And it is the Congress that spends money. There's nothing in the con Constitution that gives the President any right to spend any money. Not a penny. But they, if you remember back, they told us that deficit spending didn't matter because we owed it to ourselves. <laughs> that it was, and they said it was necessary for, for prosperity that we have a little deficit spending to, and a little inflation also, and that we could keep on going with that. And now, the pattern has been set to which the deficits are, called, are caused by what they call the uncontrollables, meaning programs that they created, adopted, and built in an automatic increase in spending every year so they don't have to go back and increase it themselves. It just automatically increases. Well, these are the things why we need more in the Congress of the people like are on this platform, more so that we can get the job done of getting government back down to where it should be and proving that nothing is uncontrollable if a Congress is willing to undo the mistake that it made. There's one thing I don't think any of us better should be afraid in the coming election year of asking our friends and our Democratic friends are you worse or better off than you were four years ago? <laughs> Is America better off than it was four years ago? Yeah. Yeah. We'd permitted our military strength, going back to the defense budget, to erode. And as it declined, so did our prestige and our national security. How many of you have heard some friend who's back from going abroad in those days and comes back and the feeling that he got over there of the disdain that so many people felt for this country. Well, we reversed that trend in the last three years and I think today every citizen of the United States is safer and the United States is more respected and more secure because of what we've done. And right here, I've got to interrupt and tell a little story. I enjoy telling it. Those guys of ours, those young men and women in uniform, when you see one of them on the street anymore, remember what it was like back in the war? If you're old enough to remember then. Why don't you, don't just pass them by, kind of smile and maybe stick out a hand and tell them you're glad they're doing what they're doing. Uh, what? what I wanted, a story I want to tell, I've been telling it all over the capital and I hope it hasn't gotten here yet. It comes from a young first lieutenant, a marine lieutenant who flies a Cobra. He was at Grenada. 
and now he's in Beirut. He moved on when they, the relief force moved over there. And he wrote back and said that while he was in Grenada, he noticed that every news story about Grenada contained one line that never varied, that Grenada produced more nutmeg than any other place on earth. <laughs> and he decided that was a code. <laughs> and he was going to break the code. And so he wrote back to say he did. In six steps, he had broken the code. Number one, Grenada does produce more nutmeg than any other place on earth. Number two, the Soviets and the Cubans are trying to take Grenada. Number three, you can't have Christmas, or you can't make eggnog, you can't make eggnog without nutmeg. Number four, you can't have Christmas without eggnog. Number five, the Soviets and the Cubans were trying to steal Christmas. And, and he wrote number six, we stopped him. Listen, I've, I've kept you standing there longer than I intended to, and I, I just want to again thank you for all the support that you've given, for the way you've rallied, and uh, all of the polls show that the things that we want so badly and that are being denied by the majority today in Congress, the polls show they're the things that the American people overwhelmingly want. Eighty-three percent of the most recent poll of the people said, yes, they want the deficits reduced, but they don't want them reduced by raising taxes. They want them reduced by cutting spending. Eighty-three percent. Over seventy percent in all the polls that I've seen say they want the president to have the line item veto. By the, by the same numbers, they want the constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And you can... So, we're going to try to talk and we're going to try to negotiate in a bipartisan fashion dealing with the deficit. But I can tell you now, I am dead set against raising taxes to do it. The taxes are already high. So, again, thank you all and... What? Tune in Sunday night. Don't miss it. <laughs> Thank you all very much. God bless you.